I want to, uh, before we get into our teaching tonight, we're going to be looking at the Trinity and the ways of God tonight, and uh, I want to start by just asking a question based on uh, the reading that we've been doing in, in Tozier's book, The Knowledge of the Holy. One of the paragraphs, and it's on, um, well, to be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure what page it's on in your book, because my book is pa paginated different than yours, but here's the quote. Um, Tozier says, the doctrine of the Trinity, and I want you to hear the words that he uses, because I want you to react to, react to the way he, he speaks here, because it's an accusation that's made against Christians quite often. He says, the doctrine of the Trinity is truth for the heart, truth for the heart. The spirit of man alone can enter through the veil and penetrate into that holy of holies. Let me seek thee in longing, pleaded Anselm. Let me long for thee in seeking. Let me find thee in love and love thee in finding. Love and faith are at home in the mystery of the Godhead. Let reason kneel in reverence outside. Page 20, okay, page 20, about the second paragraph, second paragraph in your, in your book, page 20. The Trinity is a doctrine or truth for the heart. Let reason kneel in reverence outside. What do you think Tozier means by that? Is he saying what is accused of Christians all the time? That if, you have, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to check your brains at the door. Is that what he's saying here? Check your brains at the door. Go ahead, Steve. Let's, do we have my, mics for our... Okay, great. We're all ready to go. My experience has been that people who are not believers or marginal... You know, they say they're Christian and they may have grown up in a church, but, you know, don't have any relationship with God and have never read the Bible or have just, you know, a few Sunday school stories. They listen. Their worldview is based on news, politics, this special instructor they had in school or instructors or some new fad. And so the things of God don't work according to the world because the world is governed by Satan who is the opposite of God. And, and, and uh, it's, it's in the New Testament someplace where we have blinders on it. Until you go to Jesus and say, you know what? I'm not going to be in charge. And you say, you're in charge, you know, and make him the Lord of your life. But basically you're saying, you get to be boss. Until that, the blinders don't fall off. And so... You're saying, that, check your brain in at the, at the door. Your secular, satanic world brain needs to be checked in, the, is checked in there. But the other people don't get it. And they won't get it until all of a sudden they're desperate enough to realize what they've been doing isn't working. It's really good insight. Excellent. Anybody else? What's Tozier saying here? If you want to understand your trinity, check your brain at the door. Is that what he's saying? Yeah, Larry. Well, from what I from what I read, um, he's he's saying if we can explain God, then he's not much of a god. Okay. Because the trinity is is beyond anything we can really comprehend. So it's not really checking our brain at the door, but we have to we have to operate by faith. Without faith, you know, it, we just, it just doesn't work. Very good. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think you guys, anybody else want to say anything about that? In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, God says, Come, let us reason together. You know that scripture. It says, Though your sins be as scarlet... 
they're going to be white as snow. He's talking about his forgiveness. And he uses the phrase, come let us reason. So anybody who accuses us of saying, well, you know, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to kind of check your brain at the door. Well, here's God on one side inviting us to use reason to understand his grace and to understand his forgiveness. But there is also, and, and here's, here's the reality of it. There is enough truth revealed in Scripture about God, about His ways, about salvation, about the kingdom. There is enough revealed that can be figured out in a man's mind for you to make a decision, yes or no, about God. However, that's not all there is to God. There is more, and the deep things of God, especially like what we're going to talk about tonight. When we begin to talk about the Trinity, how God can be three and one at the same time. These are some, there are some things about the revelation of who God is that simply cannot be understood logically or mathematically or, or using the, the faculties of this world, that they are not something that it's intellectually understood, they are things that are spiritually perceived. And they happen when the Holy Spirit flips a light on. Amen? The illumination of the Spirit as you grow and as you read the Word and as you pray and as you draw close to Him and He draws close to you. That's when some of these deeper truths become real in your life and you begin to understand. And so, so what... Tozier is saying is sometimes logic, sometimes reason, sometimes the, the, the uh, intellectual powers of this world just have to kind of wait outside. You're not going to get this one. And that's what he's saying here. You're not going to get this one uh, uh, by trying to figure it out with a calculator or putting it into your apple. It's not going to work. You're going to have to hear from God. You're going to have to see this thing revealed by the Spirit. And I think, Larry, what you said is just so right on. That, that, that's the, isn't that the kind of God you want to worship? A God that's bigger than you are? <laughs> a God that you can't figure out? A God that you can't put in a box? Because if you can figure him all out and get it all nailed down, then, then uh, what good is he? You know, I can do that. Then I become God. And in fact, that's where our world is going, is we are defining what and who God is. And so Tozier, in this, uh, in this little paragraph, uh, in his uh, dealing with the Trinity, is a powerful, powerful message to, to people who are reading this book. Look, there's times when we have to read the Word of God with an attitude of worship and an attitude of humility, because we're not going to get it through here. It's going to be something that's going to happen here. Praise God. And, and that's what he's saying there. So, yes, thank you uh, for that uh, input. And uh, how many got to read uh, the Trinity chapter, chapter 4? How many have done that one? Okay, good. Several of you have. Well, we want to talk about this tonight, the Trinity and the ways of God. And... Uh, this was not an easy one to prepare for because there's a lot about it that is just hard to talk about and hard to um, explain and hard to teach. And, uh, but my goal tonight is not to just teach the doctrine of the Trinity, but rather to think about how does the fact that God is a Trinity, how does that affect our understanding of the ways of God? How does that help us when we begin to think about the ways of God? And so let's pray together and then we'll get, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and, and we do bow our hearts and humble our minds before you knowing that there are things in your kingdom and there are things about you as a person that simply cannot be grasped with human understanding. And so, Lord, we lean heavily on the revelation of the Holy Spirit 
on the leading of the Spirit, on the power of the Word of God to speak and reveal your heart and your mind to your creatures. And we love you and we thank you and we give you this time devotionally. We give you this time in a spirit of awe and in a spirit of humility and worship and ask that you would teach us by your word and by your spirit tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, as you go through the scriptures, there are a lot of things about God and His kingdom that uh, come in threes. Think about it for a minute. Just think about, uh, there's the trinity of graces, faith, hope, and love. Uh, there's the trinity of man, body, soul, and spirit. There is the, the trinity of blessing, tithes, offerings, and alms. All of them have their place. The trinity of time, the past and the present and the future. There is uh, uh, the fact that the earth was separated from the waters uh, on the third day of creation and that completed um, the planet as God wanted it in terms of its physical being uh, on the third day. It made the world complete on that day. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. And making the way to salvation complete for us. Um, we have three phases in our life. We have birth and life and death. Uh, we have a trinity of leadership in, that's revealed in the scriptures among God's people. Prophets, priests, and kings. And, and that trinity of leadership is a model that led people like even the founders of our own country to look at this balance of power that was revealed by God first to Moses and uh, began to be applied in, in some ways in good ways and some ways in not so good ways, but uh, a completeness in governance. And in our country, it led to a balance of power in which we have three offices, the, uh, the judicial, the legislative, and the executive branch. But it started back with this trinity of governance, the prophet, priests, and kings. They all had their place in leading uh, the people of God. Family. The family is most complete when there's father and mother and children. There's a, that's when the family feels the most completed. Um, the number three is used 523 times in the Bible. 523 times the number three. And there's a reason uh, that it seems like the all of creation, all three realms of creation, uh, uh, things above the earth, the earth, and things under the earth, they're this trinity of creation, those three realms. It seems like the whole, the whole of creation, all of it shouts out, in various ways, the number three, the number three. And there's a reason for that. The number three is the numerical signature of God. And that's why you see it. So, I mean, we've even, even people passing away, it's interesting that deaths usually come in threes. And you, we've seen this happen over and over and over in our experience. Uh, just there, there seems to be a a pattern, and three is the number of completeness, completeness, and it is the stamp that God places all over His creation. It's everywhere. Uh, it's all, it, it manifests itself in all kinds of ways, and it's there because three is the number of the personal completeness of God, the personal completeness of God. And it leads us to what God's people have called uh, over the centuries. It's led to uh, what we began to, be, began to call the triune Godhead or the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, 
the number three is the number of divine completeness. Uh, it's formed by one plus one plus one. And if those ones are multiplied, it's still one. One times one times one is still one. Am I right, Larry? Okay. Whew, man, sometimes I get my numbers mixed up, but I, I think that's right. And, and that's the way it is with God, that he is three in one, and he is one in three. Now, and, and this is where our heads explode, <laughs> because how in the world does that work, logically speaking? How in the world can you even make that happen? That, that, that doesn't make any sense, and yet, this is what the Bible reveals. This is what the Bible shows, and so it's our task not to try to make the Bible tell us something we want to hear. Rather, our task is to hear what the Bible is saying and then conform our lives to what the Scripture reveals. And that's, that's, the, that's the way it works. Somebody says, I don't believe in the Trinity because the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah, it's not in there. Well, you're right. It's not in there. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. You can't find it. But then neither is the phrase the rapture. That's not in the Bible. The millennium. That's not in the Bible. Uh, missions. How many believe in missions? I was a missionary for, for 12 years of my life. But the word missions isn't in the Bible. Neither is the word missionary. Can't find it. It's not there. It's not in the Bible. The word evangelism, not in the Bible, not in the Bible. Uh, the word sermon, something I like to do, but it's not in the Bible. It's an unbiblical thing. <laughs> you guys are wasting your time on Sundays. <laughs> well, the fact is there's a lot of things in our Christian vocabulary that uh, are not words or phrases that are in the Bible themselves. Show, show me the phrase in the Bible, faith healing. It's not there. You can't find faith healing in the Bible. Uh, you can't find intercessory prayer in the Bible. You can't find that phrase. It's not there. Uh, or Pentecostal. It's not in the Bible. What these are, these are words and phrases that God's people have developed over the years to express a body of teaching that we're learning, something that God has revealed, something that God teaches through the Scriptures but doesn't label it. We label it. The Sermon on the Mount, for example, if you look in your Bible, if you look at Matthew chapter 5, probably the heading says, the Sermon on the Mount or something like that. That's, that's not in the Bible. That's something that an editor put uh, to, to give you a label or a handle to go by in that passage of Scripture from Matthew 5 through 7. But sermon isn't in the Bible. And so, uh, in fact, the word Bible isn't even in the Bible. So, <laughs> so what are we doing here tonight? Good grief. So, so to say, I don't believe in the Trinity because the word Trinity isn't in the Bible is, is just, you know, not understanding how doctrine develops. And uh, there's just a lot of words and a lot of doctrines where the word itself isn't in Scripture, but it defines or, or gives us a label or a handle for a body of truth or a body of teaching uh, that we can find in the Scriptures. Uh, and so, uh, I hope that's helpful to somebody. If not, it's not in the Bible anyway, it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> uh, even though the word Trinity is not in the Scriptures, from the very first verse of Scripture, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew name for God that is used in Genesis 1.1 is not singular. It would be El if it was singular there in that passage. It would be, in the beginning, El created the heavens and the earth. But instead, it's the word Elohim, or the name Elohim. And if you know Hebrew, the, the, the Im is a plural ending. It's like S on English. When we put an S 
on the end of an English word that makes it plural in most cases. Uh, Elohim is what is there. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and yet this plural name is not translated plural. It's translated God. It's not translated the gods or in the beginning gods, plural, created the heavens and the earth. It's just it's in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The Apostle John, in the very beginning of his gospel, John chapter 1, very beginning, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything was created by Him. In verse 14 it says, the Word, this Word, the same Word who was with God and was God and created everything, this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John was introducing the person of Jesus Christ. And so all through the Scripture, there's something up about God. There's something up about His person. That the God that the Bible reveals is somehow both one and three. No one knows exactly how that works. A lot of people have tried over 2,000 years of Christianity to, tr to figure it out. It was the thing that got Jesus crucified. You can't go around saying, I and my Father are one and live very long in those days. The Bible doesn't explain the Trinity anywhere. It doesn't explain it at all. It just declares. It just makes declarative statements and leaves those statements there for us to say, man, there's something up about God, about the person of God, about who He is. All throughout the Scripture, we see the Father as God. We see the Son as God. We see the Holy Spirit as God. And yet, we also see that we have one God. We don't have three gods. We have one. How does that work? Well, Tozier, in chapter 4 of your book, does a beautiful job um, just helping us wrestle with the mystery of this truth, this attribute of God, that God is a triune person. And he shows how the Bible reveals that all three persons of the Trinity are involved in the same activities over and over again. On page 23 of your book, um, he shows these things, so I'm, I'm not going to go over them in class much except to just mention them, and you need to take time and look at the Scriptures and read them and think about them because Tozier gives you a really good uh, picture of, of the teaching. It's not exhaustive, but it's enough for you to begin to see how the Bible keeps doing this. For example, all three persons are involved in creation. In Genesis 1.1, you have the Father. In Colossians 1.16, you have the Son. In Job 26 and Psalm 104, you have the Holy Spirit, all three involved in creation. And there are many places. I just mentioned John chapter 1, where the Father and the Son are seen in creation. Um, the Incarnation. While it was God the Son who took on flesh and dwelled among us, uh, all three persons are involved in the revelation and in the incarnation of God. Uh, the conception of Jesus' birth, Luke chapter 1 and 2, or Matthew chapter 1 and 2, you see all three persons of the Trinity involved, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of them involved in the birth story, uh, the conception stories of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, uh, 16 and 17, where Jesus is baptized and he comes out of the water and there is the Son and God the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased and the Holy Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove. All three of them seen as God, identified as God and yet, and yet it, we're not talking about three gods here. The Bible never talks about three gods uh, in terms of our God. Now, there were a lot of nations that had bazillions of gods, but we have one. 
in the atonement. Um, Hebrews 9.14. In your notes, I have Hebrews 9.4. Please correct that in your notes. It should be Hebrews 9.14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? All three members of the Trinity or persons uh, are, are mentioned in that one verse. Jesus' resurrection. Um, Acts 2.32, uh, the Father is there. John 10.17 and 18, the Son is there. Romans 1.4, the Holy Spirit is, is, is uh, involved, active uh, in Jesus' resurrection. All three persons are active in our salvation. Uh, 1 Peter 1.2, um, all three persons are said to indwell us when we're saved. When you uh, ask Jesus Christ to become your personal Lord and Savior, the person who shows up living in you is the triune God Himself. Hallelujah. Because it's not like uh, Jesus splits off and comes in. Or the Holy Spirit splits off and comes in. You walk uh, with the fullness, and we're going to get to this word in a minute because this is awesome, of the uh, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15 to 23 says this. Jesus is talking. If you love me, obey my commandments and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate or comforter, or several words that are used there. The word is parakletos, the one called alongside to help us. Um, in Latin, it's um, comforter. Um, uh, I will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world can't receive Him like you were saying, Steve, because it isn't looking for Him and doesn't recognize Him. But you know Him because He lives with you now and later will be in you. Who is He talking about? Well, he's talking about Himself, for one. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus was the disciples' comforter. Jesus was the one who was with them right now. But the Spirit of God was going to fill them. And yet... He is also the Spirit of Christ. So something's up with God. You know Him because He lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Wait a minute. Didn't you just say the Holy Spirit will come to you? Yeah. And now I'm saying I will come to you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit and the Son and the Father, we are one. You get the whole package. Turn to the person next to you and say, hey, we have a good deal. We get the whole package. <laughs> Hallelujah. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with, this, with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? And Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come... What? My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Who? Well, me and my Father and this advocate that I mentioned, the Holy Spirit. And yet... We are one. I am in him and he is in me and we will be in you. Wow, what's going on here? 
Our God is one God in three persons. We can't really comprehend or figure that out logically. Um, we try to explain it with illustrations like an egg. You know, there's the shell and the white and the yolk. And that's a good place to start if you're trying to talk to kids about that. It's, it, it helps. Um, water is another way that we try to talk about the Trinity because water can be a gas and a liquid and a solid, and yet it's all water. Um, so we use, we use things like that. Even humans, sometimes we talk about the Trinity using ourselves, that we are a body and we are a soul and we are a spirit, and yet we're all, it, it all it's all of us, I mean, all, all three of us are us and we are one. And so there's different ways that we try to talk about that. As I said, this Trinity is God's stamp and God's stamp is all over his creation. And so there's a lot of ways to talk about the Trinity, but none of them, none of them really get at exactly how the Godhead exists as one and three. None of them really spell that out, but it just helps us in our little pea brains to begin to get it, and begin to understand it. And at that point, that's when we kneel down and we say, Lord, this is what your word says, and if you say it, I'm going to trust that you're bigger than I am, and so I'm going to put my faith in you and in your word and what you say. One of the best things that the revelation of God as the Holy Trinity does for us is it causes us to humble ourselves, just like you mentioned earlier, Larry. It just causes us to say, you know what, we love and we serve a God who not only His ways, but His very being is past finding out, is higher than we are, is more awesome than we can even fathom in our own minds. And that's why it's so easy to worship Him. Because if we could figure him out, if we could define him, if we could label him, then we would be greater than he is. But the doctrine of the Trinity, one of the most powerful things that it does for us is it keeps us humble. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but that's a really important piece for us to get. It keeps us humble before God. So through the centuries, now any questions or comments so far? Anybody have any just Thing you want to add or take away? This isn't the Bible, so you can do that. This is just Pastor Lee. Anybody want to say anything or ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, Steve. You've got to, you, you, you've got to give up on the concept of the dimensions we live in. We live in a three-dimensional world. God lives in a dimension where there is no time, space, and so on. We think of three people trying to be in unity. You know, and put it in our terms, we, we agree together and we're, we're pretty much on the same plane. But there's time, there's space, there's individual bodies between us. God is a spirit, and the spirit operates in a different dimension. Okay, good, good. In fact, we're going to get to that in another uh, teaching on... on uh, some of the things that Tozier talks about with the uh, infinity of God and the, uh, the um, eternalness of God, what those things mean, and then again, how those apply to his ways. Um, through the centuries, uh, this doctrine of the Trinity, uh, <clears throat> one, of the important, one of the reasons why it's important is to establish that Christians and Jews... Number one, we worship the same God, and we have the same God, and we both have one God. Now, in the beginning, when Christianity first started, this was the, things that the thing that the Jews accused us of was being polygo uh, not polygamous, <laughs> uh, poly polytheists. We had many gods. We were accused of having three gods by the Jews. And it's what got Jesus crucified, because he would use some of the language that we've just used and the Jews would say, you're calling yourself equal with God? 
that's it, man, you're out. And they crucified him for that. Um, but so over the years, um, Christian theologians and Christian leaders have had to say, all right, how, how is it, how, how does it work? And we can say the Shema with our spiritual cousins, the Jews, anytime we want to. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your might. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The word Eloheinu is the same, your God is the same word that's used in Genesis 1 1. Elohim, same name. And anytime we want to, we can, we can proclaim with our Jewish cousin, cousins that we have one God. And the scriptures teach that the one God has revealed himself in three perfect and complete persons. And that's why it's so cool that we have, um, we have Metal as a part of our body who is, who is a completed Jew. And, and, and she, because she has got it that Jesus Christ is her Messiah and that she has been filled with not just an understanding of, a, of one God, but that this one God is three persons. And that's why we have a group in our church called Israel, my beloved, because there's a connection. We're spiritual cousins and we need to support Israel and pray for Israel. God has a place for Israel in his kingdom and in his plan for the world. And uh, we worship the same God. Uh, Jews and Christians on a broader scale maybe disagree, and yet um, those things will be ironed out. We'll get there. But when you read Jesus' prayer in John 17, you see the unity of heart and the, the unity of the Spirit and, and the mission of this one triune God. You just see this language all through John 17 as, as Jesus is wrestling with the mission uh, that he came to fulfill. It's not three gods, but it's one God and three persons. Jesus is not only the Messiah sent by God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, and he reveals the complete truth about who God is. Paul said, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but Paul said it so beautifully in Colossians 2.9. And this is, a, this is a verse that you should memorize. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. For in Christ Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him. Hallelujah. Oh, that, I mean, that statement is so packed, and I'm going to grab it in a minute, but it is, it is so incredible, because there's that word again, complete. The number three is the number of God's personal completeness. God is complete when we understand that He is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but that is a really important truth for us to understand. So it's not my intention tonight to, to go on a long time about the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, Tozier does a great job in this chapter, um, better than I could ever do. And, and, and our series is called The Ways of God. And so the question that I want to turn our attention to uh, is, how does the fact that God is three and one, how does the Trinity affect our understanding of the ways of God? And I tell you, this is, this, this is a tough one to wrestle with. What? Why is that important to me as uh, Joe Everyday Christian? 
why is the fact that God is a trinity, why is that important to me in my everyday life? And if I'm willing to believe that he's a trinity, then how does that work into my relating to his ways, to the way that God is and the way that God operates in my life? Does the fact that he is a trinity have any thing to bring anything to bear on the ways of God? And that's a challenging question. And I think there are three. There are probably dozens, but I want to mention just three tonight. The first one I've already mentioned. The trinity keeps us humble. In fact, the mystery of the trinity keeps all creation humble. There are things about God and His ways that we just can't understand, that we just have to receive and believe in faith. And that's why Christianity is a testimony and not a religion, because it's putting our trust in a person. And this person is a supernatural person who doesn't even fit the definitions and descriptions of a human being. He is one and three. And so I'm humbled by that. And this isn't just true for human beings. This is true for all of creation. Think for a moment. <clears throat> think about the angels of God. Just think about angels for a minute. The seraphim. seraphim. The seraphim means the fiery ones. They are angels that attend the throne of God. Well, you can look at them in Isaiah chapter 6, for example, and just see them covering, uh, the, burning, literally burning with the glory of God and somehow able to withstand the brightness of His glory. And they're covering themselves with their wings, and, and it, it's an incredible vision. But you've got the seraphim, and you've got the cherubim, and you have archangels. You have these heavenly beings who live in the physical presence of God every day. That's where they live. Uh, they, they are there. They are uh, a part of His creation. They're not human, but they are created beings, just like you are and just like I am. And they survive somehow in the brightness of His glory every day. They see God every day. They've seen and experienced things about God and about His ways that you and I can't even fathom. Think of the things that Michael, the archangel, has seen and knows about God. Think of the seraphim and what they've seen and what they know and what they've experienced of God. The ones who attend the throne. Just, just get that picture in your head for a minute. They, they, they're in the, 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 the literal presence of God and they've seen things and experienced things that we can't even get our head around. We wouldn't even have language to talk about what they've experienced, where they are. And yet they look at you as a human being and they say the same thing about us. They look at us and they say, we haven't got a clue about what human beings have experienced of God and His ways. Isn't that wild to think about? They look at you and they, they have no clue what God's grace feels like. They have no clue what God's forgiveness feels like. Or mercy. Or hope. Or faith. These ones who attend the throne of God, they have no clue what any of that looks like, what any of that feels like, what it means. They've never experienced 
forgiveness because they've never experienced sin. And so they're amazed by you and what you know and what you've experienced about God that they've never known and they've never experienced about God. So we're both kind of looking at each other and we're saying, wow. I mean, we look up at them and say, you know, man, what must it be like to live in the throne room of the Lord? What must that make, you know? And to see God anytime you want and to, to just know God at that, on that level. What must that be like as we look at these angels and they look down on us and they say, man, or, or angel, or whatever they say, I don't know what, but what must it be like to experience adoption and forgiveness and faith and fear? What, what must that be like to experience? I haven't got a clue. Isn't that amazing to think about? There's things about God that the angels can't comprehend. There's things about God that human beings can't comprehend. Boy, if that's not enough to keep us humble, I don't know what is. And it makes us bow our hearts and bow our minds. And when we think we've got it all figured out, we just need to just shut up. Amen? Just shut up. When I hear a preacher that he's got it all figured out, just, I just want to call him up and say, Brother, shut up. Because... <laughs> Peter mentions this in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, verses 10 to 12. He says, The prophets of old did their utmost to discover and obtain this salvation. They were looking forward to the salvation that you and I have experienced. They didn't know about it. I mean, they, they, they did not find it, but they prophesied of this grace that has now come to you. They tried hard to discover to what time and to what sort of circumstances the Spirit of Christ working in them was referring. See, the prophets of the Old Testament, Peter says the Spirit of Christ was working, and Christ hadn't even been born yet, but the Spirit of Christ was working in them, but they were looking forward to salvation because the cross hadn't happened yet. And, and Peter is saying they tried hard to discover what was going on, for he foretold the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow them. It was then made clear to them that they were dealing with matters that were not meant for themselves, but for you. It wasn't our time, the Old Testament prophets. We aren't going to get to experience the cross, but you have. It is these very matters, Peter says, which have been made plain to you by those who preach the gospel to you by the same Spirit sent from heaven. And these are facts to command the interest of the very angels. In other words, Peter's saying the angels could only watch with amazement as God's salvation plan unfolded. The Old Testament guys, it wasn't for us. And the angels looked down and said, it's not for us. This is, this is such a holy thing. It's such a holy thing. And, and Peter says this right after he says, you are a chosen generation. You are a holy priesthood. A, a, a set-apart people that you should show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. It's right after he says that that he says, angels couldn't even couldn't experience it. The Old Testament prophets looked forward to it, but they weren't a part of it. But you, you are a chosen generation. You got it. You live on this side of the cross. And none of the angels have experienced what you and I have experienced. That's incredible. And it's humbling. And it should keep us in our lives, and our spiritual egos in check. <laughs> the Trinity reminds us that God is greater than all of his creation. And as his prophet said, his ways are past finding out. Paul said in, in, in 1 Corinthians 2.9, 
eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We, it would, our heads would blow up if we saw what God has prepared for you and for me. The triune God keeps us in awe and wonder and humility, all of his creation, not just humans, but all of his creation. And that's a really, really, really good place to be. Amen? So that's the first uh, way that the Trinity connects with us in terms of the ways of God. It keeps us humble. It keeps us humble. Any questions or comments on, on what I've just said? Y'all good? Ready for some more? <laughs> Where are we done? Is that enough? Here's the second thing. The number three, um, God's uh, number of completeness. I mentioned that it's used 520 some times in the scriptures, and many, many times it is used um, to represent intensity or uh, importance or added strength. Uh, I give you a few examples in your notes. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4.12, a threefold cord is not easily broken. You know, uh, uh, that whole section in Ecclesiastes talks about how one and then two, but then three. You know, there's this intensity of warmth and strength and all those things. Um, the intensity of God's holiness uh, is emphasized in the declaration of, uh, in, in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 4, 8. Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah God, the Almighty, who was, another trinity, who was and is and is to come. Uh, you, you hear the threes over and over again. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, what did he say? There I am in your midst. The I am is the same. Remember we talked, we had a lesson on I am a few weeks back. The fullness of the Godhead bodily is manifested in your midst when you come together in two or three. Isn't that awesome? You, you have a need. You get three. You, you find two two. Uh, brothers or sisters or brothers and sisters to pray together and the triune Godhead uh, in, is there to intensify the strength of your prayers. There I am in your midst. There's the, the number three is used to intensify. In John um, 14, 15, and 16, um, Jesus uh, talks about sending, as I, we read part of it earlier, the advocate or the comforter uh, who he will send, he says to his disciples, I'm going to send him to you when I go to be with my father. And the word comforter is from the Latin, and it's, it's the word conforte. And in, in Latin, forte is a, is a music term. What does it mean? Musicians? Anybody a musician? What does forte mean? Louder. Bigger, and and you, when I used to do music and stuff when I was younger, and and, and uh, when you'd see forte in the music, the music director would always do something like this, you know, because it was it was not just sing louder, it was sing bigger, you know. I mean, strengthen your voice, strengthen this line, strengthen this word, emphasize this, and and. Um, the translators, when, when, it, when, when Jerome translated the scripture into Latin, uses the word comforter because of that meaning of comfort. 
strengthener. Now, our picture of comforter today is like a big fuzzy thing that you put on your bed, right? And the Holy Spirit's our comforter, and he makes me feel good. And when I'm feeling bad, he gives me chocolate, you know, and blah, 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 you know. That is so not what the comforter is. The comforter is the strengthener. He is the empowerer. He, he takes you where you're at, and he doesn't say, oh, they're there, you know, it'll be better, don't worry, it's going to be okay. He, no, he, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. There's going to be a forte happening in your life. See, that's what Jesus is saying here. So wherever you face in your life, the triune God brings all the force of heaven to bear on your life and on your problem, on your question, on the thing that you're wrestling with, on the relationship that you're trying to heal, whatever it is that, that's going on in your life, that when you bring that to God, you're bringing the completion, the completeness of God to bear in that situation, and it gives you incredible supernatural strength. That's what the Comforter is all about. And when this triune unbreakable divine trinity steps in. Nothing is impossible. Amen? Nothing is impossible. And so this, this is another way that we need to understand the ways of God. When we look at the trinity, we understand that there is an intensity of power, an intensity of strength, an intensity of wisdom, an intensity of whatever it is that God is bringing to bear in your life. And that comes from this, this idea of, of the Trinity. Praise God. Does that sound like good news to anybody? I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Here's the third, here's the third way that, that the Trinity applies, I think, to the ways of God. And I, I, I want to go back to Paul's statement in Colossians 2.9 um, and, and just expand on what I said earlier just a little bit. In Christ Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him. Is the message in that passage. The word Godhead is a direct reference to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, again, it's another one of those, it's just declared, it's not explained, it's not you know, it's just there, the fullness of the Godhead. And it's a direct reference to this triune God. And as we've seen, the number three is the number of completeness, divine completeness, wholeness, fulfillment, nothing wanting. The word is teleos. It, 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 means, it means that, that there's, I don't need anything not in a, arrogant way, but just, I'm complete. I'm, I'm fulfilled. I am what I'm supposed to be. Uh, and, and that's what the word means here. Uh, you are complete. You are teleos in Him. And what happens is that this completeness of the Trinity is what completes you. The Trinity makes you a complete human being. When you put your faith in Christ and you receive His salvation and the triune God, the fullness of God, comes and dwells in you, makes His dwelling in you, you become a complete human being. And you become a complete child of God. And you become connected in a way that completes you as God created you to be. Now, it'll become even more evident after we, uh, after we get out of this place. Because right now we still deal with arthritis and boogers and stuff like that. But someday we won't. But, but, but when, so we'll really experience it on the other side of the resurrection. But let me try to explain it the best way I can. Think of all the things that God is...
does that require more than one person? Things that, you know, if you look through the knowledge of the holy, if you look through the, the table of contents and you see all of those attributes of God, think about how many of them that require more than one person. Love. You can't have love with just one person. Well, you can, but it's pretty sick, you know. Um, love isn't love unless it's given, unless it's shared. That's yeah, part of what it is. Um, uh, joy is pretty empty if it's just if it's not shared with with someone. Fellowship, compassion, um, friendship, conversation, esteem, um, help, believing in somebody, forgiving, uh, forgiveness, grace, mercy, giving, receiving. All the things that make life worth living, uh, they, they, they require that we're not alone. That's why God said, it's not good for man to be alone. He wasn't alone. I mean, he, he was with God. But God saw that in order for a human being to be complete, there needed to be another human being. Because there's things about the Trinity that can't be expressed alone. And this is why God, or one of the reasons why God is three in one, because there are things about, it. John says, God is love. That can't be if God is alone. And so he is one in three, and he shares. There is this love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about all the time in his, in his prayers and in his ministry, the beautiful relationship as a trinity, God enjoys all of these relational joys and more than we know about and more than we can imagine. He enjoys them with himself. The, 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 this, this beautiful, someone called it, I think Tozier calls it, a, a, a dance between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit where all of these relational beauties of who God is how they're enjoyed among the three persons of the Godhead. And God is love, and God is joy, and God is giving. And, and He didn't start being those things when we came along. All through eternity, He's been that. He, I am the Lord, and I do not change. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God didn't just start loving when he made people. He was always love. And so all through eternity, there has been this beautiful, eternal relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And because of Jesus, because God became flesh, and because of the work of the cross... All of those things that make life full and rich and beautiful are made real in you when you are in Him. You are complete in Him. When you receive Christ as your Savior and your Lord, the triune God dwells in you, and if you'll let him, he includes you in the dance. He includes you in the dance. Hallelujah. This beautiful relationship now, and that's why, that's why uh, uh, Jesus uh, talks about us as a bride in the book of Revelation and Paul calls us because we're included in the dance <laughs> we're included in the love of Christ we're included in the joy of Christ the grace, the mercy, the giving and receiving, all of those things that are relational about God suddenly you are included in that and Paul describes that as that fullness of God is now your fullness. He says in another place that I pray that all the full, you'd be filled with all the fullness, teleos, of God. 
I think it's in Ephesians. He prays that. So our triune God is complete and full, and He is in need of no one to enjoy all the beauty of His creation. But you and everybody you know are invited to the dance. And when you say yes, you step into that. And that changes, guys, that changes the way we look at the ways of God. God isn't some thing up there with a club in his hand just waiting to whack you when you mess up. You're included in every part of the relationship that the Father and the Son and the Spirit enjoy. He wants you. You are a adopted, and you are accepted in the beloved. Hallelujah. And you are invited in. You, you are an image bearer. You are, you are a, Peter says, you are a partaker of the divine image. What does that mean? It means we get to go to the dance. When uh, Shadrach, this just came, came to my mind, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are standing in the furnace, and then, then the fourth one shows up. <laughs> it wasn't the fourth one. It was the fourth one. And Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego got invited to the dance <laughs> that happened in the furnace. Hallelujah. That's what the Trinity is for. It's for us to begin to relate to the Lord and His ways with this understanding that in the areas of my life where I'm not complete, in the areas of life where I am broken and where I lack, I don't fill those places with uh, stuff or people or the things that the world values, I, 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 I seek after more of him. Hallelujah. And I move closer into that, that dance that's going on between the Father and the Son and the Spirit and the bride. Hallelujah. Any questions or comments on any of this rambling that I'm trying to do. <laughs> this is probably one of the toughest lessons I've ever taught because it's just so hard to put into language the stuff that, that's, that's there that, that it's just hard to really understand. You, see, you don't understand it. You perceive it in your spirit. How many are getting the difference? Even right now, you, you, you're, this is what's moving right now as we talk. How many? See, it's the Holy Spirit, and you are perceiving what I'm trying to teach. If, if I was sitting in a, in a university classroom at U of M in a philosophy class, they'd be all on their cell phones texting, and this is the stupidest knucklehead I've ever heard, because they wouldn't be getting it at all, and I'd be just wasting my time. But you are people of the Spirit, and you are perceiving what I'm trying to teach the best I can. And, and God is talking to your heart. And as he does, then, then he can take this that we're trying to learn and apply it to your life in terms of you seeking his person. And in seeking his person, you begin to know his ways. Hallelujah. And so that's why it's so important to know that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one and three. Ah, man, that's amazing. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we just... It just amazes me, Lord, that before human beings were even created, you had already decided that no matter what choice we made 
you were going to make a way for us to join the beautiful life flow that happens between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, something we can't even get our heads around, Lord. The unity in Trinity. And that if it meant you being the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, then so be it. Because, Lord, you couldn't reveal yourself to us without showing us the beauty of relationship, the beauty of love, because it is who you are. And so, God, we are just humbled by the scriptures that tell us that you are one in three and three in one, and, and, and we don't try to understand it. We are like Anselm who just said, God, just let me receive this in love and love me as I receive it. But Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to go further, and as we walk through our daily lives, uh, Holy Spirit, speak to us. You said that uh, you would lead us in all truth, and, and show us how the triune God makes us complete. Show us how uh, the triune God intensifies your power in us and through us. Show us, O oh God, experientially how the triune God uh, fills those dark voids in a human life that aren't meant for anything else but God. That we would truly be, teleos, we would be complete in you. And Jesus, call us constantly to our knees. Call us constantly to be humbled by the fact that heaven shakes their head in amazement at us just as much as we shake our head in amazement at them. We are both amazed by a God that's bigger than all of us. And we thank you that you are. And we worship you because you are. And we want to serve you because you are. And so, Father, I just pray for every person in this room that you would just take the, these words and this attempt to talk about you this way and, and just, just clear out the dross and, and bring forth the light and the truth and let it burn in our lives and show up, oh God, in our relationships as we join the dance. And we thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you guys. I love you. Thank you.